It's not as if we all start out with the same brain structure. They are different by nature. Think about this. What if the communication center is bigger in one brain than the other? What if the emotional memory center is bigger in one brain than the other? What if one brain develops a greater ability to read cues in people than another? In this case, you would have a person whose reality dictated that communication, connection, emotional sensitivity, and responsiveness were the primary values. This person would prize these qualities above all others and be baffled by another person with a brain that didn't grasp the importance of these qualities. In essence, you would have someone with a female brain. From Chapter 1, What Makes Us Women, The Female Brain by Dr. Lou M. Brizendine. Welcome back, podcast listeners. It is another Monday, and we are here to bring you another superb, fantastic, incredible guest, Dr. Lou Ann Brizendine. And before I get rolling and unveiling her many accomplishments, um, I wanted to take a moment to say that on this day, well, I'm recording this this intro November the 7th, so on this day... <laughs> A, the first female vice president, a woman of culture, was elected in the United States of America. And I needed to take a moment to acknowledge that, how, to acknowledge how incredibly happy for our neighbors in the South on this day, on their day of celebration, that we are for them. The balance that feminine energy has the potential to bring in a role of leadership. Again, I don't know if I've said this word enough times yet, monumental, which is why uh, it is just so, I mean, the timing couldn't have been more magnificent that today we are joined by Dr. Lou Ann Brizendine. Dr. Lou Ann Brizendine is an American scientist a neuropsychiatrist who is both a researcher and a clinician and a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, as well as the founder and continuing to serve as its director, um, the UCSF Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic, all the while maintaining her status as a New York Times bestselling author of two of the probably... Uh, the most influential books of my time for myself, uh, for the journey that I have been on, The Female Brain and The Male Brain. Now, I know I kind of sort of promised no more long intros, but I didn't say anything about no more fangirling. So I just have to say, getting to meet someone whose life's work changed my life changed my reality, changed how I saw myself and helped me to understand how I see the world. And then getting to share that person with you, our listeners, it is a privilege and a highlight of my life that I will take to the grave with me. Um, And so I just, again, I can't state enough just how, how full of gratitude and overwhelm Um, and just, I'm just, I'm humbled by this experience. Uh, and also I want to say that I'm also really excited to say that now that I'm a little bit older than I was when I first read the book, Luann is also coming out with a new book, The Upgrade, How Women's Brains Change for the Better in the Second Half of Life, coming 2021. So if you haven't read her first two books, The Female Brain and The Male Brain, please, do what you got to do to get in line for that book. I mean, uh, rent it, borrow it, buy it, whatever it is that you have to do. I promise you that that book, both of those books, they are not chalked end to end. They're not snooze fests full of uh, scientific dialogue that uh, will make you fall asleep. I promise you. They are, I mean, it is storytelling at its most magnificent. I mean, she takes science and she melds it together with 
with real people and real experiences and the real going ons of um, of the inner life of women. And you guys, you just, you won't be able to put the book down. I swear to God, like hand to God, you will not be able to put this book down. So uh, without further ado, um, Dr. Liu Ann Brizendine. Good afternoon, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We have Luann Brizendine. Luann Brizendine is a neuroscientist. She wrote two of my favorite books. And we're talking, I mean, when people ask me about books that have changed my life, these are two of the books that I, I can't recommend enough. Thank you, Luann, for joining us here on the podcast, Focus Forward. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, how are you doing today, Luann? We're doing great. You know, we're all kind of still on lockdown for the uh, coronavirus, but um, other than that, here out in California, it's uh, smoky and uh, wildfires. But other than that, <laughs> what else can you say? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, Luann, I was wondering, um, I've already obviously already done a bit of an intro, uh, but I was wondering if, you know, from your own words, if you could just Tell us more about yourself. I mean, I'm sure our listeners would love to know, you know, where you got your start, how you became interested in the brain itself, what motivated you to write your books that you've written, and um, just what keeps you passionate about about where you're going in life? Well, you know, um, that's an interesting question because um, I don't know how far back you want me to start, but, you know, I was born in, I was born actually in Kentucky and Appalachia in a very poor region there. And then, you know, we kind of moved around the country quite, quite a lot. So I kind of came from a, from a fairly, um, my mother was a school teacher. So I came from a background where my parents, um, really were kind of educated and interested in education, but we were, we were very poor and didn't really have a lot of advantages, but at any rate, I was able to get really interested in a biology very early kind of in my high school days. And, and uh, you'll like this one. It's like, I, I, my, I wanted to go to college to UC Berkeley, but I didn't quite have enough money to come the first quarter I wanted to come. So I, um, I, my parents said that if I made half of the money for the first quarter, they could pay the other half. So, you know, what I did, I, st I spent three weeks dancing in a, in a teenage go-go bar oh. and, um, <laughs> love it. I love it. um, uh, you know, my mother would come down pick me up at two in the morning. It was good. We had quite, it wasn't not anything that they were <laughs> very proud about, but at any rate, that's how I made money to go to my first, first quarter of UC Berkeley to undergraduate my freshman year. And from there, I, um, I got very interested in studying neurobiology and I, the hormones and behavior was very early into some of what the researchers were working on in terms of like how giving a hormone, you know, they do all the animal studies, how giving a hormone to an animal or how hormones in humans cause our behavior and in what ways they cause our behavior by activating certain, certain switches you know, called receptors in the brain and can actually turn on or turn off of behavior. So I thought, God, this is, this is really down my alley. I loved it. So that's what I studied. I did an undergraduate degree in neurobiology in, in UC Berkeley in the, in the 1970s when the feminist movement was very, very big. And those of you who had work study jobs, so I, I worked to put myself through college too. Um, and I worked in this, in the, uh, a little library off campus called the Women's Her Story, H-E-R-S-T-O-Y, Her Story Library, sort of cataloging um, things that, that women had done in history because that was at the era when, when the um, equal amendments right was trying to be passed. And, you know, we had a lot of that history. So I was very, I was involved in the women's um, movement in, in the feminist movement in the early days in Berkeley in some kinds of ways. At the same time, I was studying, you know, this whole, the whole biological field about the brain and hormones. And um, in that era, it was very interesting that they, that the idea was also that women couldn't be equal to men 
um, and if there was any difference. So you, it was what I called mandatory unisex, like female orgasms had to be the same as male orgasm, female this, female sex drive, female, it had to be the same as, it was kind of mandatory unisex. Otherwise, if you weren't exactly the same as men, you couldn't claim that you're equal to men, which I know is kind of a funny idea nowadays because where we've moved so far beyond that. But in those days, that was what it was like. So here I am studying the the hormones and the genders, what makes the, the female behavior, female sexual behavior, male sexual behavior different. Um, and yet the whole culture was like, oh, no, no, don't say there's any difference. It's not allowed to say there's any difference. It's just the same. So I was being sort of a heretic in one area of my life. And, <laughs> and then in the other of my, you know, I'm like, what, 19, 20, 21 years old at this point. And so I was... You know, um, it was I, I, it was colliding, colliding in my brain all at the same time. But um, it was it was sort of fascinating because then fast forward to then you know finishing that and then going to medical school and and um, learning more and more about the brain and going into psychiatry, learning all kinds of things about you know. I found out when I was in medical school and studying psychiatry that that women's um, depression was two two to one different two times more in females than in males and so i started looking at that and they the age that that starts is between you know female and male children children girls and boys have about the same amount of depression or anxiety as each other it's about a one to one ratio and it doesn't guess what doesn't start to split until ages like 12 to 14. Mm. So when the menstrual cycle happens, so the average age, average age of your menstrual cycle starts um, uh, for uh, Latino and Caucasian girls about 12, for African American girls about 11, and for Asian girls about 13. So all during that time is when, of course, the girls are getting the cycle, the cycle starts up, right? The cycling mm. of hormones every month does something to change our female brain's vulnerability to depression. So that was clear to me, but of course, nobody else, it was mostly males in my field in those days. So they didn't, they didn't think about stuff the same way I did. I, I, you know, I look back on it now and think like, gosh, you know, I was, I was saying something that was kind of Greek to them. They just sort of didn't get it or didn't understand why I thought it was interesting. So anyway, fast forward to, um, um, you know, deciding to start the women's mood and hormone clinic when I left the um, the East Coast. I was at, I went to uh, to medical school at Yale and I did my residency and faculty at Harvard, then came back to California at UC San Francisco to take uh, a job at UC San Francisco. And um, I started something called the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic that was specifically for treating women's, you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, all those kinds of things that had fluctuations based on the fluctuations in the menstrual cycle. And of course, you know, mostly it was all men, all men in my outpatient department at that point, I was the only woman. Wow. And they, they all would just kind of say, oh, that's just Luann's hormone clinic. So <laughs> that was, and that, you know, so fast forward to that, that's doing that for, for 12 or 15 years before I wrote the female brain book. Um, so the female brain book is like a condensation, condensation of all the things I've learned for 25 years in, in the field of hormones and behavior in women. And then of course, a few years later, I wrote the male brain and which kind of then used all of the, the things about the male hormones and male behavior and, you know, male, uh, and female differences. So that's how that's, that's a fast, fast version of how I got to where I got. I, I mean, I love it. I mean, I think, you know, for those of you listening, um, you already know about my great fascination with, uh, you know, biology and the human brain and the hormones and the difference between men and women. Um, but you know, one of the interesting, one of the interesting things I, I want to tell you about how I actually came across your book. And I don't know if in our previous conversations, I'd really, you know, told you the whole story. And I started to work on my book, uh, Sonder. And there was, there was this part I was writing about, about this, what seemed to me, you know, even just going back um, 15 years, you know, or 17 years or whatever, however long it had been, I was looking from the outside in at what had 
what had provoked me to make a split, what looked to me like a split second decision. So my, I had been groomed um, to become a prostitute at that time or child sex trafficking as it's now referred to. But there was this moment where I, I didn't understand why it was this specific moment that triggered me to suddenly say, okay, okay, I will go out and take a date and exchange, um, you know, oral sex for money for this group of people. I, I couldn't understand it. And I, you know, I was, I was looking so hard to, to write the story from a place that would help other people understand this decision that I myself still didn't understand. And so I was walking through, I was living in Red Deer, Alberta at the time. And I was walking through, I, I was always haunting the stacks of books. And I am not even kidding when I say that all of a sudden a book fell out of the stack, literally at my feet. It was just a freaky Friday moment. And the book was yours and it was the female brain. And I picked it up and I went, huh, that's interesting. And I'm a big believer in signs. And so I was like, I was like, well, I guess I'm taking this home today. I don't really know what it's about. And then I took it home and I started to read it. And it blew my mind because it answered so many questions. In fact, it answered the question that nobody had been asking because nobody knew to ask it, which is, which is why I really get a chuckle out of you saying that, you know, when you were asking questions in school and men were looking at you, like shaking their head going, Oh no, like we don't know what, what is your after here? It was the similar thing. I had all these questions. Nobody had the answers because they weren't women that were engaging um, at that time looking for, you know, answers to what was taking place within human trafficking. And what, what came up was biological instinct. And for me, it was so, it was just such a beautiful moment to finally have that aha. And what I loved is in, in one part of your book, uh, The Female Brain, you say, biology becomes destiny. And now I'm going to paraphrase, but if we lack awareness about where we come from and what's going on with our own bodies and our own hormones and our, in our own lives. And that was so entirely true. What had driven me to make a choice was biological instinct. And I would just, I'd love to dive into, I'd love to dive into this with you. <laughs> and I don't even know where to begin because I have so many questions, but I really think maybe if we started at the beginning with the with the young with the young little girls, um, I believe it's three months is is when girls start to have their brains flooded with hormones that start to change the way that they view reality and the way that they see themselves. Maybe you could take us from there. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's really it's something that's not really known very much by even a lot of scientists, but it's a it's a time of, of human development between the age of one month old after you're born and in, in girls from one month old to almost two years old, the ovaries start pumping out huge amounts of, of estrogen at, you know, at of levels that it was almost like adult females. And it lasts for a couple of years. And they think that why all that estrogen is coursing through their whole body is to kind of set up the whole brain and body to kind of prime it for, for both female behavior and female reproduction. And at the same time, between one month old and about nine or 10 months later, first year maybe old of boys, it's also called infantile puberty, their testes, their testicles are pumping out huge amounts of testosterone, almost up to adult male levels. And it's flooding the brain and body, sort of priming the whole brain and body to for male behavior and for male sexual behavior and fertility. So then human beings, I mean, a lot of animals just kind of go and start right into puberty right away, but we, we humans have something called childhood. So all these hormone flooding things just switch off at about one or two years old. And we have males and females have about the same low levels of estrogen and testosterone from their testes and their ovaries for about up until like, 9, 10, 11 years old for girls when the very, actually, you know, the, the early beginnings of releasing the hormones again and waking up the ovary again, the, the pituitary starts to wake the ovaries up again at, you know, sometimes 9, 10, 11 years old. And then the first period doesn't happen until about 11, 12, 13. Boys start, uh, their pituitary starts to wake up the testes again. 
at about ages like 12, 13, 14, and boys at about 13.5 is when a boy tends to average age for first wet drink for boys, um, that which sort of tells you that the whole male system is working at that point. Um, so they, we have childhood, we have that whole period where there's not any like of the hormonal fluctuations that will go on later. And the hormonal fluctuations that went on in that first year of life, and actually when you're still in, in utero as a fetus, were going completely full blast until they got turned off for the period called childhood. So that's, that's kind of how things all get started for the rock and roll of puberty. Well, I, what, what I find so fascinating about that is, you know, before the childhood, when the hormones are going crazy, um, my, my interpretation or my understanding of what I read in your book is that this is where, this is the defining age where girls are becoming wired for reading emotion and they, and they're also interpreting or attaching their self-value and worth um, to when people pay attention to them or, you know, facial expressions and learning to read. Is that, was that a correct interpretation of that? Yeah. So, so what we know early is that, um, you know, little girls, a couple of things happen. So little girls start to pay lots and lots of attention to faces and sort of like, you know, the, the, have, having that emotional action. If you've ever had a little girl that's like, you know, whatever they are, they're like, you know, they're three or four and they'll sit on your lap. And the first thing they'll do is they'll kind of like, they'll touch their ears and look at you know, your earrings. So they'll look at, you know, they kind of, they kind of inspect you and look at, look at all of your little, like the, the, the female, whatever you're wearing. There's lots of little girls who are very interested in all of the, the, um, the kind of fashion of being female. And, you know, lots of little girls start to be very interested in having things match and go together. And so part of that, what that's about, of course, is like, they want to fit in and they want to be like the big girls. They want to be like the mommies. They want to, so little girls will play what's called, they start to do a different type of play. And about three or four years old, they've studied the difference in play behavior of little of females and, and males. So little boys will do this kind of play that's called more of a rough and tumble play. They'll come up and sit with the girls. The girls will sit and play with each other saying like, okay, now you be the mommy and I'll be the daddy or you know, you be the you be the doctor, I'll be the patient. And there's this one-to-one -one relationship, what's called role play, little girls do a lot. You can get a little boy to do that with you about one go round, but then he's bored with that very quickly. He's like, you know, some other kid comes along, knocks him on the shoulder and he's up and running like, come on guys, let's go get them. Or let, you know, they are out there, you know, like, you know, hunting out the enemy or, you know, the, and this is just a very, it, no one taught them to do this. It's not something you ha you don't have to teach them to do this. And of course, this is about nine out of ten little girls versus nine out of ten little boys. It's obviously uh, there's an overlap. And some some little boys prefer the the girls games, and some some girls prefer the boys. But on the whole, it's got this you know. And little girls will start to get lots of reinforcement from their from their teachers, from their culture, from their peers from their peers parents from their you know from from everything about oh you look so pretty or oh you're so nice or oh you you know so there's a part of what we call the culture starts to get in there too and reinforce all of this kind of female typical behavior of you know of being nice and paying attention to emotions and and this what we call tend and befriend behavior that that girls tend to do with it gets a lot of that hormone oxytocin release by you know cuddling and and patting patting your dolls and patting each other in a very kind of tender loving care and you know wanting to play mommy and wanting to do lots of of nurturing of of babies or baby animals is something that for females is very, very kind of typical behavior. Boys just love this kind of rough and tumble play. Let's go get them there. They're wanting to, you know, go out there and explore the world in a very, very physical way. And our culture reinforces them for that. Oh, you know, what a strong boy, what a big boy. And, the, you know, the bit about big boys don't cry. You know, so boys, so there's a cultural piece that gets imposed upon your biology and hormone piece. And most scientists and most psychologists and most sociologists feel that 
it's about 50 50. This is all that stuff we call epigenetic imprinting and that your culture imprints some things on your, on your behavior and on your genome that, that sort of makes, ends up making you who you are as a, as a boy or as a girl, as you grow up, it reinforces that. So um, these gender specific behaviors that we start little bit by little bit when we're younger start to play out more and more as we get older. And it's almost, there's lots of books written about this by, by psychologists, like how little boys and little girls in some ways grow up in a slightly different culture with each other. You know, you know, that's how boys say girls have cooties, you know, at that certain age, it's like, they don't want to play with the girls and they basically are very disrespectful of the girls, you know, in kind of groups. Um, and you know, girls find boys very annoying at that age. They just kind of come and mess up your play, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this kind of, these childhood differences are, are the foundation and basis for which we then like launch into the, the puberty years when the, when all of a sudden boys hormones start to go a little bit and they start to, they start to notice every pair of breasts that walk by. I mean, they're their testosterone is starting to trigger all these circuits in their brain where they're starting to notice female body parts. And female body parts, if you, if you read on page 38 and 39 in the female brain, those two pages, most guys love those two pages of the female brain because it talks <laughs> about this time, time in their life where they're, you know, you're re- as, as a guy and you start to think you're, a, a, a lot of um, guys will say, I used, to, I used to think I was starting to be a pervert at that age because all I could think about is like, you know, I could think about pussies, I could think about breasts and, you know, every everything that was going around, I started noticing all these female body parts and it was all of a sudden, and I, until I realized other guys were doing it too, I thought there was something wrong with me. So there's that, that stage that boys go through too, that we, we females don't tend to appreciate that time in a boy's life is, is very confusing and hard too. And of course, girls start to get much more interested in, um, you know, pleasing boys at the, at the puberty stage. And just like boys, they, they're, the male brain is set up to search out fertile females and mate with them. Mm -hmm. That's their kind of desk. That's what their biological destiny is. Girls, on the other hand, are trying, their whole hormone thing is to try to get male attention, try to be attractive to males, try to have males say how pretty you are, how whatever, you know, they're trying, they're trying to, they're really interested in having male attention at age, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, on and on. It's just like, they're really interested in being told, you know, and I think that fits into the grooming thing. Cause it's like, you're actually interested in being told how pretty you are, how whatever you are, how sexy you are, how this you look, you know, it's like, there's a whole there's a whole longing for that. And the female brain's whole biological destiny is to attract the male so that you get impregnated and you have the next generation. I mean, that's kind of our biological de- destiny. So you got to know that that's kind of what it's doing to you on, under the surface. I love that. Um, one of my favorite quotes of yours, and I'm, and I'm going to butcher this because I, I only ever remember things in partial clarity here, but you said that... Um, Men look at boobs the way that the way that young girls look at butterflies. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I just giggle every time I think about that. Exactly. They can't take their eyes off of them, you know. And like in the male brain, I talk about how, you know, in a male in a, like kind of in a teenage and adult male's brain, and just in just in men's brains in general, it's like having, you know, how when you walk into a sports bar, there's always the there's always the TV set going on in the back. There's always some sports game up there in the background all the time. Well, mm-hmm. in a male brain, it's like there's always that sex game going on in the back of their heads at all times. It's just all, like the television in their brain about the sex this is always on, you know, and it can be louder or quieter, but it's just always there. Well, and and I love that actually that you brought that up because um, you know one of my biggest conversations that I'm I'm always reinforcing when I have the talk about sex trafficking is that we can't be flipping the narrative um, to ending the demand and thinking that that's going to start by pinning um, blame and shame on men, uh, you know, for for being attracted to women and or for you know see, see, 
seeking and searching for this outlet of sex. Um, so I love that you that you brought that up because I I think it's such an important conversation um, to touch down on. And you know, one of the other conversations I actually really wanted to to touch down on is you know, the female bossy brain, pink aggression, um, which, which will segue us into the teenage brain here in a minute. I, I remember reading in your book when you were discussing that women, the tendon befriend, um, women's brains light up and, and the hormones flush our brains when we're having conversations, when we're engaging with other women. Um, but that the reason partially why that happens is because we our biological instinct or the reptilian brain trusts other women to take care of our offspring if something were to happen to us. And can you explain how that, you know, how that works um, hormonally, but also uh, how that can affect um, the grooming process when young girls ages, you know, 12 to 18 actually groom other girls and why it is that they're able to do that and bring them into prostitution? I mean, I mean, we saw it with the Jeffrey Epstein case, you know, they, I think they called it, it was kind of like a pyramid scheme where they said, you know, they'd get one young girl to bring in another young girl. I personally call it um, prey turning predator, but I know that there's so much biological play at work here. And I would just love to get your take on that. Well, you know, it's like, it's also that there's, you know, um, girls, you know, girls want to be included. You want to be invited. Mm. You know, one of our, you know, we want to be invited. We want to be included. We want to be, we want to be, we want to be seen as one of the group. And if, if another girl that, that we, you know, and we, we tend to trust females and not be very suspicious, you know, about other females, because it's just kind of like the girl group. Right. And so the, you know, and you don't want to be left out. It's like, you know, in junior high, it's like the in group and the out group. It's very painful people will not be invited to a birthday party or to invite, be invited, just to want to be invited is a natural, normal thing. And so I think this pyramid skin type of thing you're talking about is, is really plays on that. It's a very, you know, it's, it's just like, it's a built-in system in the female brain of, you know, wanting to be included, wanting to be invited, wanting to be part of the group. I mean, it's also true with boys. This is kind of how they, they end up being bad actors. They're being, you know, one guy is being like a bully and whatever, and the other guys just don't want to be seen as not going along with them. So we all, the human beings have this need to be included and be part of the group and be accepted and be, um, be seen as somebody who's, you know, um, um, on the invitation list. No, I love that. Um, one of the things that really stood out for me was about how when young girls, you know, so so most, not all of the listeners know, so I'm going to bring it up here. The average age um, statistics show that it's between the age of 12 to 15, which of course is, as you were saying, when the menstrual cycle starts, when the hormones start flooding, when girls begin to, um, you know, flirt and discover their own power. Uh, with their sexuality. And, and, but that also what comes from that is, is a lot of vulnerability, you know, because it, these are experiences and emotions and sensations that we've never had before. And one of the things that fascinated me the most about your book, and this plays into how I myself was groomed um, when I was 16, I was groomed by a 15 year old, which is the engagement of conversation. Every time we had a talk, I remember people always assumed I was on drugs when, when I was being sex trafficked and I wasn't, but to be honest with you, I felt like I was for the first, for the first couple months. And that's because I now know that, um, when girls engage in conversation, there are three main hormones at play that explode in the brain that are, uh, I believe it's oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin. Yes. And, yeah. And those how, are the feel good, those are feel good hormones, the, the feel good feel hormones. Good. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that having those three hormones, um, circulating and, uh, saturating the brain is second only to an actual orgasm, but it's also on par with a drug addict seeking heroin and or crack cocaine. That's right. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what fascinates me about that is, you know, again, that's that biological instinct and that biological state taking over and driving the actions um, of young girls who have no idea that they are in the throes of this um, 
just you know, of, of this biological state of, of the, in, under the influence, I guess, essentially <laughs> you're under the influence and you do feel yeah. high and you do feel drunk and, and you are feeling wonky and people are like, are you on drugs? And it's like, no man, I'm just high off my own chemicals. <laughs> and we are well high off our own hormones at that stage. And girls, I mean, what females, so our female, our female, um, testosterone peaks, the highest peak that it'll ever be is 18 or 19. So it's way on the way up by 14, 15, 16. It's going as high as it'll ever be in your whole life. And so if the, the testosterone gives you the drive to like be sexy, be flirtatious, be, you know, because the average age that you're supposed to get in, in the wild, you know, if you're living in the in a different culture that you're supposed to get pregnant and have your first child at 17. I mean, it's just everything is wired in the female body to, to do that. And so it's, uh, you're, you're, you're wanting the power and the, discovering the, the power you have over men, power you have over males at a, you know, all of a sudden you grow breasts and all of a sudden you're being noticed, right? You know, you're noticed like you're turning heads and, and, and it takes a while to get used to the power, but then, you know, you start to like to play with it. And then, you know, having other girls, um, you know, like the one that was 15, that was, that was grooming you having great conversations and, and having, having fun together is just like, a, you know, all those hormones in your brain are just like, bing, 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 like you're hitting the jackpot. Yeah. Well, and, and it makes you want to do more and be more, and it, it makes you want to embrace, you know, the culture itself more because the, the more, the more conversations you have, the more, re, you know, rewards you're um, receiving in the brain and, and the more, which then creates more feedback from the other person. So you're constantly seeking, you know, um, an even stronger connection with these people because you're constantly being validated by your own um, neurochemical, what I like to call a shit storm in your head. And what fascinates me about this part, and again, you know, I'm, I'm going back to how I myself was groomed. I can't speak for other people out there, but you know, when, when the relationship was established with me and the gang that I was a part of that, that turning point for me, and this is the part where I said, I had no idea why I suddenly flipped and made a decision to engage in sex trafficking. It actually had to do with the bottoming out of, uh, my happy, my happy, uh, hormones, which was again, the dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and the rise of, um, I believe it would be the cortisol. Is that correct? Your stress hormone. Yep. The stress hormones. So the minute that my friendship was pulled into question, um, my brain panicked and thought, oh my goodness, worst fucking case scenario. I'm going to be kicked out of this gang even though this girl hasn't said anything and, and in your book you call it pink aggression it was a it was a subtle suggestion that i should be coming with her but oh no no it's your choice but the tone in which it was said in implied that there would be a break in our friendship and i now understand my brain went shit 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 this is my survival and if i'm cast out biological instinct goes if you are cast out of this crowd you will be vulnerable and you will be living on the streets by yourself and you will have nowhere to turn to. But all of this oh, is taking yeah. place silently. It is, it's, you know, it's neurons and receptors and it's my reptilian brain. I have no idea that this is the conversation that is taking place within my own body. All I know is panic and I need to submit to whatever it is that's being asked of me. I need to. Oh yeah. You don't right? want to be ostracized. Ostracism for human beings. Ostracism or being kicked out of the group mm. is like a 911 call to the brain. Like do something to be, to show you're part of the group, do mm -hmm. something to show you're included, you know, in boy yeah. gangs that have to do with guns. Sometimes you're supposed to go out and commit a murder in order to, to prove that you're part of the gang. And it's all about, it's like this, you know, it's staying close to your, just being allowed to have the cred, credibility to be in the group and doing whatever it takes to stay in the group. Right. But what most people don't understand, which is just the beauty of all the work that you do, is the influence of the hormones on our actions, right? Like mm -hmm. so many people will say, I don't know why I did that. Same with me. I mean, gosh, for 20 years, I had no idea why in a split second I went from you know, oh, I'll spot for you. I'm a part of this group and, and I'm here for you to split second decision. Yep. I'll get in that vehicle. 
you know, and, and it's such an important um, piece of the puzzle, I think, for people to really become aware of why sex trafficking is takes not just takes place, but why the age group 12 to 15 is the most vulnerable. You know, I mean, it's not just because they're unaware of because they become your family. Yeah, they can become your family. And what happens is the teenage Teen, your, your whole thing is to like separate from your family of origin or separate from anybody who's trying to control you that's a parent or anybody that's trying to control you and separate from them and go your own way is such, it's your full blast in your whole body, your hormones are, are trying to blast out of the orbit of like being held back by any family member. And so then you pop off into a another group of your peers. And if your group happens to be like the group you were in, like that was your that becomes your family for all to te- that's what that's happened for all teenage and the vulnerability of that stage. Like you say, that age from 12 to 15, the peers are much more important than the family by far. Yep. You know, I, I really want to take a jump because I, I don't want to take up all your time here today. I want to take a, a wild jump and, and there's a few more things I really want to touch down on, but I would love for our listeners today to hear you speak about neurochemistry, hormones, and how they influence a woman's reality, desires, and values. Because I think that that's just such a a fascinating conversation to to have here. And did you have something particular in mind in terms of the book you were liking? Yeah, so um, I really want to touch down on when, when people you know, do manage to extricate themselves from sex trafficking or from an, uh, an emotionally violent or physically violent relationship. Um, the different ways in which the hormones have an influence on, on the healing and, and the neuroplasticity of the brain. Um, because I think that that so many people, I hear this all the time in it. And honestly, it just bugs the heck out of me, which is, you know, a, a day in the life is a lifetime sentence. And I just, I cannot get behind that because I know the power of the brain. I know that we are capable of expanding our universe and not, we don't have to stay in a constant state of retraction from it. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear your take on how, as we age, the hormones start to shift um, and how the influence of that uh, affects our reality. And then how the, the neuroplasticity of the brain allows us to heal, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So I think one thing to keep in mind is like, no matter what our experiences are in the past, and you know, no, no matter what, like, let's say, for example, let's, no matter what traumas somebody has been through in their childhood, or in their adolescence, or in their adulthood, those traumas are like, they, they have the, the, the equivalent in the brain of taking a Jeep and driving it down a muddy road. And then the road dries up and the mud dries and those those tracks are all there. So mm-hmm. there's a tendency every time you're going to drive that Jeep down that road again after that, that it's going to fall into those ruts. So it's like in the brain, it's very, it can become very crusty and difficult. So some something needs to happen in the brain to stimulate plasticity. So it so, somehow you need to be able to take the off ramp from that and let that let that kind of gel back up so you can make some different ruts or going down a different path and not keeping going back down that pathway in your brain where those ruts are. So, you know, you need, to, and the brain is great. It can, it can build whole, whole other different roads and doesn't remember, it doesn't mean that the memory of those and the memory of those tracks aren't still there in your brain, but they don't have to be driving you all of the time. You know, it's like, okay, it's there. It's something that you deal with. It's something that comes back sometimes in flashback. It's something that triggers you from time to time, but it's not your whole reality. It can be a piece of the pie of your reality, but it's not the whole pie. Mm -hmm. And so the, the more that you basically put together a different life for yourself, you have different peers, you have different friends, you have different relationships, you have a different experience of yourself in the world with other people that starts to become your reality. And that's going to be the road that you're driving your Jeep down. Not that old one with the dried out ruts that, that, you know, was, was from a painful time. It might be a memory back there. You may get triggers back there from time to time, but you will get out of it. And there are ways to build the neuroplasticity of the brain and the way all the chemicals in the brain, finding other things that give you that dopamine rush and give you, give you sort of fun excitement that you can feel, 
bonded to other people will kind of take you down a whole different path and that those ruts won't always be there to kind of grab you. I love that. Um, you know, and, and, and these are what I like to call actionable steps that we can take towards reclaiming our own power. And, and I, I would love to talk about, you know, just the different things that affect hormones because, you know, when I was on the streets, obviously I, I was young, I was a high school dropout. I had no idea, um, the, the role that, you know, different, uh, foods, uh, different hand creams, different shampoos, all of these things are capable of affecting our hormones. And could you expand upon that for us? Well, I think that one of the one of the things they know, just in terms of the type of you, to feed all the cells and hormones in your entire body, you need to have you know a healthy diet the best that you can without getting you know poisoned by chemicals or poisoned by plastics. You know all the things that we know aren't good for us. So, it and to really keep all of your hormones flowing and keep all of your brain chemicals flowing and healthy, your heart, your breathing. You know, uh, there's really eating eating a very healthy diet um, is and getting the right amount of sleep and the right amount of exercise is what the body the basic needs of the body you need to turn, go back to basics which is like sleep food basically sleep food and and uh, you know having some exercise and then the other balance to that too is like you know having having connections with other people that love you mm. and however you have to put yourself in the presence of people that are safe and that really care about you um, and choose choose and you know you know how you can select and deselect the box deselect the box of people who just interrupt your being peaceful and serene in your life and check the box for those people who are at who help you become a more peaceful serene person capable of just kind of soaking up the the care warmth love compassion of other people i love that and then i just um we're, we're almost up on time here so I, I want to i just want to talk a little bit here about how women have a special ability and and i'm bringing this up because as we are healing when it comes to ptsd when it comes to men um, partners, brothers, fathers, uh, uncles, uh, you know, and just anybody in general who's trying to understand what it is that we're going through. Um, I want to discuss about how women have a special ability to recall not just a memory, but the feelings of the memory. Because I, men, men don't engage in that um, as strongly as women do, if I remember correctly. You mean in terms of the memory circuits and the the um, well, women definitely because they 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 are able to. We have a memory for emotional events, mm-hmm. and there's always this joke of like you know that 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 you have a you have a partner and whatever, and you'll say, oh honey, don't you remember the time we did this or the time we went to this or this happened, and and he's not remembering any of it, but he's nodding his head, of course, but <laughs> he he knows he's supposed to remember, but he doesn't. You, you may remember those things because they had like. They were very emotional for you. I mean, if there's something really emotional that happens to him where somebody scares the shit out of him or something, believe me, he's going to remember that too. So it's not that he's got a problem with his memory. It's about, you know, what grabs you emotionally. As a fe- and females, what can grab them emotionally uh, are the kinds of things that they're going to remember. So you're exactly right. Yeah, yeah. I remember it just really struck me how... Um how intense my PTSD flashbacks were because I wasn't just having a memory with like a a teeny tiny amount of feeling. I was stuck in timeless reliving and my body, you know, what I, what I discovered firsthand before I read about it was that my body does not know the difference between 10 years from now, 10 years prior and right now present in this moment. It only knows what my what my brain is interpreting for it. And so when I would get stuck in this timeless reliving, it would bring up um, all this cellular memory or this memory stored. And I would be feeling it viscerally um, in, in this continuous loop. And I and I just remember reading uh, in, in one of your books there that uh, men don't have as strong a visceral reaction um, in recalling the feelings with a memory. And so I, I always just thought that that was just such a fascinating um, conversation that that you had in your book. So it was really, yeah, it was just wonderful. Um, 
yeah, I think, I think that that doesn't cover even half of what I want to talk about. <laughs> we're just, I know we're just getting started. We'll have to do this again. It's just been really, really nice and very lovely to get the chance to talk to you about all this because it's yeah. really, you know, it's got, it's just, it's so important to understand the foundation of all this so that then you can turn back to yourself and your own experience and validate your own experience as being, oh my God, that's, you know, that, that's, that's, that's true for me. That's how, that's how it is. That's how it's, that's how it feels. And I'm, I'm not crazy. This is really how it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just, I just love the influence of your book. I love, I love how you just, you opened me up to awareness of my own body and the awareness of the influence of the hormones on my reality. And, and you really, you just, you, you brightened that up and that allowed me to seek out new realities that allowed me to take control of my life, of my body and, you know, and work towards the future that I really wanted to have. And, and it all starts with awareness and your book is just, I mean, I, I can't recommend it enough and I can't thank you enough for, you know, following the path and the journey that you went on and for standing up, you know, in a room full of men and holding true to what you knew and, you know, fearlessly pursuing that, you know, and you're just, you're such a leader. And I, and I just, I can't thank you enough for being just you. Oh, well, thank you. That, that, that touches my heart. Thank you so much for saying that. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me and thank you to your audience for listening. I just really hope that something that they heard today will also touch their heart and have meaning for their lives. Exactly. Well, we hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And I will talk to you um, in, in the next few minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Disclaimer, this podcast is for informational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions or viewpoints of the host, producer, other guests, or sponsors. I, Rayan K. Irving, am not, nor have I ever been, a doctor or therapist, and none of what I say is intended for professional or medical advice.